Infelizmente, chegamos à última apresentação desse nosso seminário. É, é com grande prazer que eu vou chamar para a palestra, cujo tema é Vidas Paralelas, Liberdade e Poder, o nosso grande ídolo, inspirador, o legendário fundador do Mrs. Institute, Lou Rockwell. Ilio, how great it is to be here, what an honor it is to be here. I didn't have a chance to go to the uh, first Austrian seminar in the United States but in 1974 in, in Vermont, but I feel like I'm at the Brazilian equivalent, so it's uh, a, gr a great moment. I'm going to talk about two economists who live parallel lives and pursue two different and contrary goals. One was devoted to liberty, one was devoted to the state. The first remained a teacher for his entire life, never in any prestige institution, never exercising any power. Indeed, he used his post teaching against the exercise of power and became the world's most powerful intellectual voice for radical liberalism or libertarianism. This man who loved liberty died in 1995 and his work has taken flight the world over. His books, are selling as never before, all of them, and his star is rising by the day. His name is Murray N. Rothbard. The second one became the most powerful and influential economist in the world, practically running the world for a long time. While he was in power, he was revered by anyone who was, ever, who was anyone. His every utterance could cause billions to be made or lost in the market but he will live out the rest of his days under a cloud of derision and discredit, defending himself against the perception that he created history's largest financial calamity. His name is Alan Greenspan. Let us track these two lives and consider the choices these men made. As Charles Burris has pointed out, they were both born in New York City in 1926. Rothbard was born on Tuesday, March 2nd. The following Saturday, March 6th, Alan Greenspan was born. They had a not unsimilar background and upbringing. Greenspan of German Jewish heritage, Rothbard of Russian Jewish heritage. Both attended private schools and pursued their respective passions. It is after high school that their lives diverged, whereas Rothbard followed a very mainstream path in academic economics, one that would seem to clear the way for him as a giant in the profession. Greenspan went to the Juilliard School of Music to pursue his true love, the clarinet. As remarkable as it may seem today, Greenspan was not interested in economics, at least initially. I mention this because it is an implausible beginning for the man who would later take the helm of the institution that would purport to manage the world reserve currency and a man after whom a professorship at New York University has been named and who has received so many other honors. Meanwhile, Rothbard decided to attend Columbia University. He was not at first an economics major. His passion was mathematics. And this was even before the full mathematicization of the profession. At Columbia, he studied under the famed statistician Harold Hotelling. It might have been Hotelling who led Rothbard to economic studies, but very early on, Rothbard, the mathematician, could see what was wrong with the application of, st of statistical methods to economic theory. He would later build on Mises to construct a systematic theory of economics rooted in logical dedu deduction in the manner of the 19th century theorists. All the while, his libertarianism was also in strong formation from very early in his youth. As implausible it may, as it may seem today, Rothbard's biography would seem to be exactly what made for professional triumph in the mainstream of opinion and with the powers that be. What made that impossible were the choices he made, choices made on principle and for the love of truth and liberty. Unlike Rothbard, Greenspan's grades were only average and he departed to perform with the Harry Jerome Orchestra, playing saxophone 
or clarinet as necessary. He traveled the country on buses between engagements, but understandably he tired of that life and in 1945 changed his school and his major to economics. School was New York University, where Mises had begun teaching that very year. But Greenspan did not study with Mises, whom he might have regarded as a washed up old man who could do nothing for his primary concern, which was his career. Instead, he chose the NYU division called the Factory, 9,000 students competing in various fields of specialization in business. He graduated with honors in 1945 and enrolled in the master's program, graduating in 1948. At this point, the lives of Rothbard and Greenspan briefly intersect in an interesting way at Columbia University. Two years earlier, Rothbard had received his own master's and had enrolled in the PhD program. Professor Arthur Burns was the most prominent faculty member. Burns would later become Eisenhower's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and Nixon's chairman of the Federal Reserve. One might say he was the Greenspan of his day. Greenspan dropped out of the Columbia economics program to follow Burns to Washington, a model for a life of chasing powerful positions and powerful people. Greenspan watched Burns carefully, impressed at how economics in an age of positivism could be used in the service of state-connected careers. Rothbard, meanwhile, stayed behind at Columbia, writing and studying. One of his seminal articles in this period was published in a book in honor of Mises, that supposedly washed up old man who just so happened to have a penchant for speaking truth to power. Just as Burns became Greenspan's model, Mises had become Rothbard's model. Two more opposing career paths could hardly be imagined. Mises had been tossed out of two countries for his principled stance and forfeited prestigious positions in the profession because he was unwilling to go along with historicism and Keynesianism. Rothbard would follow a similar path. His article, written in honor of Mises, published in 1956, was a reconstruction of utility and welfare economics upon non-mathematical lines. Here we have the graduate student doing what a principled scholar does, pursuing truth through research and writing. He might have chosen to echo the rising Keynesianism and positivism of his day. Certainly he was intellectually capable of becoming a famous master of both fields. Instead he rejected them intellectually and took a different path along the lines laid out by Mises. And what was Greenspan doing? He was running around Washington, pandering to the big shots, watching their every move, striving to be like them, and attempting to follow in their footsteps by cultivating press contacts and relationships to people in high places. Rothbard received his Ph.D. in 1956, but only after jumping over a thousand barriers that had been put in his path by none other than Greenspan's own mentor. There were times when Arthur Burns's recalcitrance drove Murray to despair. He felt he could not comply with Burns's dictates, that he could not please Burns, and that Burns seemed to be sabotaging his work. Burns was not his dissertation advisor, was not even on his committee, but such was his power in the department that he could interfere. Ironically, Burns had known Rothbard since his childhood. They had lived for a number of years in the same apartment building. There could be no question that this was a personal attack against Murray. Only when Burns moved away and became so wrapped up in Washington politics that he no longer cared was Rothbard finally able to win out and his PhD was awarded in 1956. Now let me make a few comments about Rothbard's dissertation. It was an empirical account of America's first serious business cycle, US, the US's first serious business cycle, I should say, the Panic of 1819. He scoured every source he could find, producing many pages of detailed economic data. He also knew the importance of ideology and personality in the history of economics, so he recounted the debates over the policy response. Then as now, people urged intervention. But unlike today, the government did not respond to the demands for inflation, price supports, 
bailouts and fiscal stimulus. As a result, the panic ended and the economy recovered very quickly. What was the fate of this dissertation? For more than 50 years, it has been the standard reference on this episode. It was printed and reprinted many times, cited many times. Today, the Mises Institute has an edition, and it continues to sell on a large scale. Let me hop ahead to Greenspan's dissertation, which wasn't filed with New York University until more than two decades later in 1977. It was quickly sealed and continues to be unavailable to anyone. No one had any idea of what it contained until last year when a single copy was leaked to a reporter for Barron's. What it contained was so irrelevant that it barely made the news. It was a collection of reports he had written for various purposes over the previous 20 years. A PhD granted for life experience, we might say. What did Greenspan do in the intervening years? He founded a consulting company, Townsend Greenspan, and worked for the National Industrial Conference Board. To understand Greenspan's, Greenspan's firm and what it did, it's important to understand the role of the economic expert in an age of positivism. In the post-war period, the scientists with the Gnostic-style knowledge and shadowy connections to power ascended to massive public fame. The substance itself didn't matter so much as the illusion of expertise. What his firm sold was Greenspan to such powerful clients as J.P. Morgan and company. Greenspan carefully crafted his image as an omniscient pundit on all matters related to economics. He used his connections to Burns and rising connections to all related power elites to build up a reputation as a monk-like data collector, poring over charts, coming up with printable comments and predictions. It was mostly illusion. There were no charts and data collections and machines to make perfect predictions. What Greenspan did was to commodify his own pandering ways and sell them to a culture hungry for illusions. All throughout the 60s and the decades following, he worked to craft his persona so as to fit perfectly with the prevailing ethos. That ethos was statism, the glorification of central management by the experts. Greenspan sought to be on the top of the heap. Let me say a few words about Greenspan's connections to Ayn Rand. The press routinely misunderstands the meaning of this relationship. The only writer who has, I think has gotten it right, aside from people in the inner circle like George Reisman, Nathaniel Brandon, or Murray Rothbard, is Frederick Sheehan, author of Panderer to Power. Sheehan points out that Greenspan's relationship to Rand was always opportunistic and never had any effect on Greenspan's life. She was a famous author on the rise. Greenspan was the master of hitching his wagon to any horse on the move. Rand herself called him the undertaker. She would frequently ask her associates, do you think Alan might basically be a social climber? Her intuition, of course, was correct. But what the Rand episode illustrates is also ter terribly unflattering for Greenspan in another way. It is bad enough to be a person who cravenly seeks power while remaining in ignorance. But as Greenspan revealed in his 1965 article called Gold and Economic Freedom, written for Rand, he actually knew the truth. He knew that the Fed creates business cycles. He wrote this in his article, even getting the story of the Great Depression right. He knew that fiat money builds the state. He said that the gold standard is the only monetary guarantor of freedom. It's bad enough when a person devotes his life to the service of power when he does it in a state of intellectual ignorance. But when the same person pursues a path in a state of published knowledge, it seems to me even more reprehensible. Thus, his relationship to Rand was no different from his relationship to anyone else. He used her as a stepping stone towards his real goal. I should add another parallel. Rothbard, of course, was also a member of the Rand Circle, though expelled when he refused to demand the demand to convert his wife to atheism or divorce her. It was only a few years 
Following the Gold article, the Greenspan angled his way into the Nixon campaign of 1968, taking the job of coordinator of economic policy research. He began to shuttle back and forth between New York City and Washington that would define the rest of his life. In 1970, his mentor Burns was sworn in as the head of the Fed, and here is where Greenspan set his sights on that position as his lifetime goal. Every choice he made after this point was dedicated to that. All the while, he maintained his high public profile, making as many as 80 speeches a year and pulling in huge consulting fees while otherwise pretending to live a monk-like existence, studying charts and tables and doling out bits of advice and wisdom for high dollars. Despite the personality cult he was building, his predictions were almost always wrong. Let me give only the most famous example. On January 7, 1973, the New York Times fe featured his picture with a spread on brilliant market forecasters. He was quoted as follows, it's very rare that you can be as unqualifiedly bullish as you can now. Four days later, the market peaked and bottomed out 46% lower one year later. This was typical for him somehow able to build a reputation as a prophet while being wrong. His method was always the same, using high-flown rhetoric and obscure language while dissembling and faking. It was a perfect method for government work. And so that same year, he became head of the Council of Economic Advisors for Richard Nixon. In 1974, he urged President Ford to propose a new tax as a means of combating inflation. He was involved in the Whip Inflation Now campaign, complete with its win buttons, though he knew full well that the real culprit was not a lack of morale in the population, but a Fed, but a Fed that would not stop the printing press. A few years later, he winnowed his way into the Reagan inner circle and became head of the Social Security Commission. He urged dramatically increased payroll taxes, perhaps the reason he was appointed and they were imposed. All of this was mere prelude to 1987 when the goal of his career was at hand. He was nominated for the position he'd been training for almost his whole life, head of the Fed. What happened soon afterwards was the famous stock market crash of 1987. Here he did what he would do again and again during his 20-year tenure. He opened up the monetary spigots. He did it again and again. Monetary pumping was his one weapon. Think to take just some of the examples of the Mexican debt crisis of 1996, the so-called Asian contagion of 1997, long-term capital management in 1998, the Y2K crisis of 1999 and 2000, the dot-com collapse, and finally the 9-11 terrorist incidents in Washington and New York. Oh, and never forget that Greenspan on November 13th 2001 was awarded the Enron Prize. Essentially, he proved himself adept at serving the state whenever it needed help. Politicians used Greenspan as what Sheehan calls their air raid shelter. He did them a favor, and they returned it by appointing him again and again. And they fawned over him as few have been fawned over. And it's no wonder he was history's biggest counterfeiter. You can see the map of this in the federal funds rate. Looking at the chart from the 60s to the present, we see a huge arch with the peak in 1979 and the rate trending steadily downward to the present level of zero. The only way this could be justified would be through large increases in savings and capital. We've not seen this. The picture of lower and lower rates is wholly artificial, and, not only, and of course it's also bubble-inducing in the extreme. What we are experiencing now in the U.S. and elsewhere is a direct result of Greenspan's tenure, which led to the greatest financial catastrophe in modern times. And make no mistake, every bit of it can be blamed on Alan Greenspan. We know from the on-record reports of everyone who has worked with him that he ruled the Federal Open Market Committee meetings with an iron fist, never seeking anyone else's opinion nor tolerating dissent to his political intuitions. He would beat back any contrary views with withering stares and implicit and explicit rebukes. 
It was ruled by fear and intimidation thanks to his political connections. He could make or break people. He also continued to cultivate his public image as a way of crushing disagreements within the Fed. The message he sent through his high status was, don't you dare disagree with this God on earth whom all people adore. For a time we had the entire Wall Street and Washington establishment singing one long united chorus of the hymn, Thank God for Greenspan. He encouraged this, sending his minions out to tell the press that he deserved credit for all good things, an uptick in employment, a downtick in the trade deficit, an optimistic earnings report from Wall Street. No matter what the news, he would take credit for it. Those were crazy times. An article appeared in the New Republic magazine that told of a cult on Wall Street involving candles, incense, and iconic Buddha-like images of Greenspan in the back rooms of big firms. The story was preposterous, like so much in the New Republic, but believable. It took some time before anyone figured out that it was fake. I don't need to tell you how the story of Greenspan ends. His world came crashing down around him. He spends his time today trying to explain his way out of the blame. Much to his everlasting disgrace, he's intimated on many occasions that the meltdown was not his fault, but a fa nor a failure, of course, of the government, but a result of inherent flaws in the market. Ayn Rand speculated that this undertaker might just be a social climber. She did not and could not have known that he would eventually climb all his way all the way to the top, fall all the way to the bottom, and while writhing in shame, would betray the entire cause to which he pretended devotion. But anyone who looked at his life could see the pattern. It was not a complex one. He served the state. As Rothbard himself wrote, quote, Greenspan's real qualification is that he can be trusted never to rock the establishment's boat. And did he serve the establishment from the first day to the last? Now I'd like to turn back to Rothbard and his life. When we last left him, he had just completed his dissertation. He was about to embark on a great journey that would consume his entire life. He published in the established journals as long as he could, but at some point his quest for truth and love of liberty meant he would be cut off from them. Despite his brilliance and his credentials, he did not get a prestigious university post. He worked for a private academic foundation, reviewing all the latest books on U.S. history, philosophy, law, and economics. His massive treatise on economics that appeared in 1963 began as a tutorial written on behalf of that foundation. When he did get a position, it was at Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute. It was not in an economics department, but rather, as Joe Salerno pointed out, in the Department of Social Sciences. There was one other economist on the faculty, a communist. <laughs> um, he had a dumpy office. He had a bad salary. And mostly uninterested students who were all engineering majors. But it hardly mattered to him. He had the freedom to write and publish and tell the truth, and that's what he wanted more than anything. And yet even here, his options were limited. As a brilliant supporter of the free market, one might think that conservative journals of opinion would be open to him. But soon after the Cold War intensified, he could not be quiet on an issue of vast importance to him, namely the relationship between liberty and military expansionism. He saw the warfare state as nothing but a species of socialism, and he adhered to the credo of the old classical liberals, a free market plus an international outlook of peace. For this, he was excommunicated by the conservatives. The result was that he ended up building his own global movement, and one that began in his living room. His two dozen books and literally thousands of articles ended up inspiring a vast worldwide movement for liberty. His economic writings bridged the gap between Mises and the current generation of Austrians and added mightily to the edifice. His wonderful personality demonstrated to one and all that it is possible to have fun while fighting Leviathan. As for Rothbard's own character, the contrast with Greenspan could not be starker. If Greenspan was the dreary undertaker, Rothbard 
was the happy warrior. Rothbard thrilled to spend time with students, faculty, anyone interested in liberty and Austrian economics. When you spoke to him, he was glad to talk about the field of interest that was the other person's specialization, whether it was history, philosophy, ethics, politics, Baroque church architecture, religion, music, sports, or even the soaps on TV. He always made others feel important. He was always excited to give credit to others and draw attention to the contribution of everyone to the great cause. He never held a grudge for long. Even for those who betrayed him personally, there was always an opportunity for reconciliation. All of these traits derive from the, his amazing generosity of spirit, to which I attribute his love of truth above all else. His too short life was cut off in 1995. But that was also the year that the web browser became common in offices and homes. Those classes that Rothbard taught in his small New York classroom and later at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas are now being broadcast around the world through iTunes and Mises.org. His books are all in print and selling as never before. There are not only his books, but books on his books and an entire literature growing up around his legacy. Some have said that Rothbard was his own worst enemy. People said the same of Mises. The idea here is that they could have helped their career by going along to get along. And of course that's true enough. But is going along all we really want out of life? Or do we want to make a difference in a way that will outlast us? At some point in our lives, we will all come to the realization that all the money and all the power we can accumulate will be useless after we die. The legacy we will leave on this earth comes down to the principles by which we lived. It is the ideas we hold and the way we pursue them that is the source of our immortality. Greenspan will live an economy in shambles and a lifetime of pandering. Rothbard left a grand vision of liberty united with science and an example of what it means to truly think long term. In all ages and in all times, people must make a choice. Will we accept the world as it is and try to fit in, getting as much as we can from the system until we bow out? Or will we stick to principle, pay the price that involves, and leave the world a better place? I submit to you that anyone who has ever truly loved liberty has chosen the second course. This is the course that the two Mises Institutes are dedicated to following. May we all individually make that same decision. Thank you. Quem quiser fazer pergunta, só pedir um dos microfones. Eu tenho aqui já algumas perguntas. Um, Lu, se o Greenspan sabia de todas as consequências de suas políticas, por que você acha que ele fez tudo o que ele fez? Vaidade, fama a qualquer preço, pura maldade? Well, it's probably all of those things, but I think... I, I, I think it's fundamentally that he wanted power. Uh, St. Augustine talks about the city of man being dominated all too often by those who themselves are uh, uh, ruled by the dominandi, the libido dominandi, that is the lust for power, the lust to rule over other people. And these, of course, are by and large the people who go into government. Those are the people who are attracted into government. Not everybody. Um, maybe not the postman or whatever, but the people who tend to climb to the top of government are, have, a, have a, a power lust. There's a, uh, was a long interview was, um, conducted by a, a man named Medvedev, not no relation to the present president of Russia with Khrushchev when he was in his uh, forced retirement. And uh, from the book that he, this man wrote about Khrushchev, I was always struck by one particular point. Khrushchev said to him, you know, when you get old, everything pales. 
clothes, food, fast cars, dachas, women. He said, he said uh, you lose interest in everything. He said, but you never lose interest in power. And of course, there, there are people like that. There are people, most of us are perfectly happy to try to run our own lives, take care of our own families. We don't actually want to run the person next door, the town next door, the province next door, the country next door, the whole world. But of course, there are people like that, and they go to work in government. And so I think that's the basic explanation for Greenspan and pretty much all the rest of them. Uma outra pergunta. Ayn Rand é a autora mais lida na Suécia e hoje tem um público crescente para suas obras no mundo. O senhor vê a influência dela para o libertarianismo de forma positiva ou negativa? I think I think it's a it's a positive thing. I don't think it's I don't think I would say it's entirely positive. Um, just to take one point that, that Murray, although he was pro-religious, was not a, not a, was an agnostic. Uh, but he always felt that the, that Rand's influence towards sort of an evangelical atheism was a problem. He said, he said, for all of human history, in every society at all times, virtually everybody's been religious. So he said, for libertarians to take um, a position towards the sort of evangelical atheism would turn off everybody. He said it's not part of libertarianism. Murray was always one of those who, there's a controversy in some circles between what one philosopher calls thick libertarianism and thin libertarianism. Does libertarianism also include all kinds of other, other things besides the question of liberty? And Murray, Murray said no, that libertarianism is a political philosophy that um, says that liberty is the you know, most important political goal. Uh, it's not a religion, it's not an ethic, it's not, there's, you need many, you need many other things to supplement libertarianism as important as libertarianism is. So he thought that Rand in that way was a bad influence. On the other hand, I think the, um, you know, her, even though she had some, uh, um, what I was her economic fallacies based on her view that uh, economics could not have a, sub a subjective value theory. She liked Mises, she loved human action, although her copy of Human Action is full of denunciations of what Mises is saying, but they were very, they were close friends. She admired him, and she did a tremendous amount to promote Austrian economics, but she did feel that, uh, sub that everything should be, that all value theory should be objective, and in fact she uh, appointed George Reisman to come up with an objective value theory for, uh, for economics, and of course there was only Smithianism, Marxism, Ricardianism, and that's what he did. So, you know, there's those, those sorts of things, but are, are the vast majority of young people, and it's mostly young people, uh, who read Rand, I know, inspired by her, and directed in the, in the, towards libertarianism, towards Austrian economics, and towards the cause of freedom, I say absolutely. I mean, I was, and I, I, uh, I think that's true of, of virtually everybody else. So I think she's very much of a plus, you know, um, There are few bad things, but as the years pass by, these things become less and less relevant. Tem uma pergunta aqui. Podia levar o microfone. Ah, você está com o microfone. Pode falar, Rodrigo. Tá. É, Liu, qual a sua opinião em relação a, do ponto de vista ético ou de resultado, do ponto de vista do Second Best Solution de Chicago, por exemplo, até onde um libertário que deseja mais liberdade individual poderia meter a mão na sujeira chamada governo em prol da liberdade? Ou se a probabilidade maior é dele ser engolido pelo Leviatã, é o poder, já que o poder corrompe? Well, uh, I should first admit that I once worked for the government. Uh, I, I've since gone straight. But, uh, no, I had the honor, honor to work for Ron Paul. And so I would say that Ron Paul shows that it is possible to work in government for liberty. However, the fact that there's been one guy in the last uh, however many hundreds of years doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence that that's the path. But if you have, uh, you know, the Ron Paul sorts of principles, if you can stand up against uh, the opposition of your colleagues, although he's a wonderfully uh, gregarious man, a great athlete too, which helps, I mean, a, like a champion swimmer and a champion baseball player, Uh, always a, a much sought after player on the Republican baseball team. Uh, so that, all that sort of thing helps him. But 
as, as you, you know, if you, if you follow him, you know that how many times he's the one vote in the House of Representatives against something. And uh, in the beginning, that was thought of as just ridiculous. It was, he was just an embarrassment. But of course, if you see that there's, if, the, if a vote is, there are 435 members in the U.S. lower house in the House of Representatives. So if you see that there's a vote of 400 to 35, that it doesn't necessarily pique your interest. But if you see it's 434 to 1, then you think, well, gee, well, you know, why did that guy, why did he stand against everybody else? So it's caused, it helped cause a lot of uh, attention. And then, of course, this presidential campaign, which caused millions of young people in America and across, in North America and across the world to become interested in the Fed. I mean, I've been interested in central banking for, I'm not going to tell I mean, dec many decades, and I could never get anybody interested in it at all. Um, it was a name on the bill in their pocket, and that was about it. Ron Paul in that one presidential campaign got everybody interested and uh, in a Rothbardian sense, because Ron is very much a Rothbardian figure. His populism, his principled libertarianism, his anti-war position, his anti-Fed position, all Rothbardian. They were very close friends, and Murray a strong, a strong influence on Ron. Uh, but if you look at you know, how Ron got uh, explained that there's an econ the economic error involving uh, Murray always said it's important to explain the economic error, as Ron has done over uh, what the central bank does. If you see his, his uh, most recent book, End the Fed, it's a great description of, of all that. But he also shows that we're being ripped off, in Rothbard's phrase. And Rothbard always thought it was so important to explain the error and also show these people are, are, uh, are stealing from you uh, in whatever aspect of the government we're talking about. So, you know, we have free will. And uh, Ron Paul has certainly shown that it's possible to do that. But again, I, I think for the, vast, for the vast majority of us, it's probably not a good thing. I mean, it really is very corrupt and corrupting politics. And it's, um, I think of even Thomas Jefferson, who was a rotten president. He's a great guy before he was president, a great guy after he was president, in terms of what he was saying, anyway. And um, while he was president, he did a lot of bad stuff. So. Uh, but as Tom Woods pointed out, there is, we do have the heroic example of Warren G. Harding, who uh, also freed Eugene Debs, who had been, um, I don't know if that name resonates, but he was a famous American left-wing labor leader who had opposed World War I and had criticized the draft, and for which Woodrow Wilson sent him to federal prison uh, under sedition laws. And uh, in the prison, his, his health was ruined, and he didn't live much longer. But it was Warren G. Harding's, as a re conservative Republican, his first act to free this left-wing um, labor union guy um, from prison for, for a speech crime. He also pulled American troops out of Haiti. He did a lot, did a lot of other great things. So there can be presidents who, who uh, are on, you know, who are decent on the uh, when weighed all together, but. Again, the record's not good. So, I mean, I would never recommend anybody going into politics, but if, you, if, that's, if it's fun, if you want to do it, you have a vocation for it. Um, I'll just mention also, Ron Paul's got all the sort of best, of, this is a, an odd sounding thing, but also sort of all the best aspects of a politician in the sense that he wants to convince people, he wants to teach. When uh, he would have contested congressional elections, and these days he, uh, he pretty much is a shoe in every time, but he would wear out, speaking of shoes, five or six pairs of shoes walking his congressional district. Door after door after door, stop to talk to people, explain, answer questions. He loved doing that. And he knew how to create coalitions. He knew, how, he knew what particular point in the libertarian philosophy to make to the particular person, try to bring everybody together. As he always says, that freedom, freedom brings us together, whereas the state divides us. Um, so if you've got those kinds of qualities and you've got that kind of uh, desire, you know, that desire, you know, go to it, but I, again, at least in uh, U.S. history, um, as far as I can tell, there's only been one guy like that in all of U.S. history. So uh, um, I, don't, I myself don't see that as, the, as, uh, as a great thing for the average libertarian. But. Na linha do que você mencionou, Lou, sobre o Thomas Jefferson ser um, um bom cara antes do governo, depois do governo, mas não no governo, Uh, há uma pergunta aqui nesse sentido. O problema do Fed e a crise americana 
não, não tem mais relação, não teria mais relação com incentivos equivocados, que seriam naturais de um sistema estatal, do que com o caráter do presidente de momento do FED, de quem esteja lá? Oh, I think that's right. Um, you don't get appointed to these jobs, of course, unless you're willing to be a bad guy, uh, whether you're the Supreme Court or, or uh, cabinet officers, heads of the Fed, heads of all the federal regulatory departments. Um, they're not appointing, let's put it this way, the Elio Beltraus of the North are not appointed to those jobs. So that's, uh, that's just the way it is. And, uh, um, but I think the incentives, you know, the incentives are all wrong if, from our standpoint, the, pe the people who are ruled for the rulers, if, again, they have power lust. So, yeah, it's not, a, you know, they can, that's how they can gain more power over people, by going into the government, by becoming Fed chairman, by doing all these terrible things, by bailing out the banks and Wall Street and creating this vast business cycle and all that. Um, but I think it's, uh, so, yeah, the, the incentives are wrong, you know, from, from our standpoint, but they're not wrong from their standpoint. Um, Robert Higgs, the wonderful Robert Higgs, uh, had an article talking, and he started out, he was talking about the, the state schools in the U.S., the public, the secondary schools, and saying that everyone always says that they failed. And he said if you look at uh, literacy rates, if you look at uh, just in general what people are, what children are learning, uh, the crushing of uh, independent thought, independent uh, minds, um, this sort of uh, stupido um, uh, uh, classes that are taught, the exams that are given, everything getting stupider and stupider year by year. He says, you know, from the parent's standpoint, from the student's standpoint, that's a failure. But that's not a failure from the state's standpoint. It's exactly what the state wants. They want an easily controlled population. And they set, set out to... So um, I don't think you can um, disagree with, with uh, some of our speakers yesterday, but I don't think you can think of the state as a firm. Because, uh, of course, if a firm is uh, sending guys out with guns to grab your money, it's not a business, right? It's a criminal gang. And as Rothbard always talked about the state as a, as a criminal gang writ large. That's the, he, said if you, he said you will understand virtually all of libert what, what libertarians believe if you think of the government as a gang of thieves. Then everything follows from that. Um, so the incentives for a gang of thieves are different for the, for, than for the people who are the producers and live peaceful lives and uh, are productive uh, economically and raise nice families and uh, go to church and live their lives well. Um, so I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know if it's so, it, the incentives are wrong, but whether you can ever have good incentives in the state, I don't know. I'll just mention Ron Paul once introduced a bill, obviously um, having fun with it, to uh, pay the members of Congress a, a huge amount of money as a percentage of what they would cut from the federal budget. So let's say they, let's say they cut a hundred billion dollars from the federal budget, they'd all be rich. And they could be even richer if they kind of cut a trillion or whatever. So that was, you know, that, I mean, it is possible to conceive of setting up the right incentives, but uh, difficult to see such a thing implemented. Lu, uh, durante o seminário, nós tivemos uma palestra sobre homeschooling do, do Kleber Nunes, que corajosamente declarou que não vai cumprir a determinação do Estado por considerar essa determinação imoral. O que você acha da desobediência civil? Well, first of all, I, I think he's what a tremendous hero he is, and I, it's one of the great things I think about about the U.S. We have so many millions of children being homeschooled. It's a great act of secession uh, from the regime. Uh, there was just a, uh, a German family that got political asylum in the U.S. Uh, because they were about to be jailed in Germany for the crime of homeschooling. So it's, it's uh, not only a crime in Brazil, but in Germany and other countries. Um, I believe in civil, di civil disobedience. On the other hand, I would, I would very much hesitate to urge civil disobedience on anyone because I think it's such an individual decision. Because, of course, if, you're, if uh, one is not pro-violence, and I think one ought not to be pro-violence, uh, then uh, you're going to have, you, know, you may very well have terrible consequences. So I think that has to be an individual decision, but I think civil disobedience is uh, moral, and um, I tend to think that uh, sort of a mass peaceful resistance 
to uh, the regime is the way that we'll actually uh, bring some things about in the future. So I hope, but I certainly hope that he doesn't, hope he doesn't have to suffer the results of civil disobedience. I hope he can continue to raise his children and continue to be an example to everybody who knows him. Uh, he's a great man. Qual a sua opinião sobre o modelo de Hayek de free banking, que seria a reserva uh, fracionária sem, sem lastro determinado? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I like to start in a little different place. I, I, I think Hayek's view of competitive currencies um, is right now a very interesting one, probably much more uh, likely of success than the gold standard. The gold standard, unfortunately, requires good guys in the government, or at least uh, people who feel it's in their interest to bring about honest money. Um, I know Ron Paul is finding that uh, it's a much easier argument to make that people think that, well, maybe there is something wrong with a monopoly. Why shouldn't uh, American Express or somebody else be able to, to issue their own currency? Uh, as long as it's a voluntary thing. Um, since I'm an anarcho-capitalist, I certainly don't believe in laws against free banking in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, government laws. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think, you know, I'm just quoting Salerno and Rothbard and Thornton and Woods, um, I don't think that, that uh, fractional reserves are going to think they're capable of creating the business cycle, among other, among other questions. Hoppe makes the point that it's the equivalent of a used car dealer issuing uh, more titles to cars than he owns. And he goes, to, you know, and, and uh, uh, offers them a security to people. Uh, so even, you know, even if people know he's doing that, Hans feels <laughs> there's something funny about it. Uh, and of course, this is the, the juridical argument against um, fractional reserve banking is at the heart of uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus Suerte de Soto's huge and magnificent treatise on uh, money and banking and business cycles, which I highly, highly recommend. And I believe, a, I think a Portuguese translation is underway of that book. So that would, these, it's, because it's huge, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while. But, uh, um, so I'm, I'm uh, I, don't, I don't think it's good. But on the other hand, if, you know, if you and a banker want to make an agreement to that event, I mean, I'm, I don't think it should be illegal. But I think it can have bad effects. Rothbard thought that the way to to uh, try to hold these bad effects to a minimum was to encourage private uh, bank run squads. People would sort of watch out for who the, uh, uh, who the banks that were really getting out of hand in terms of fractional reserves and warn the customers, hey, you know, all your money is not in there. You better get it out. This, by the way, is a felony in the U.S. if you do this. If you, because you can't, you can't uh, libel a bank. You can't, in fact, tell the truth about the bank, that indeed the money's not there. It's all been loaned out. And they've just got a small fraction. Um, so, but it's, it's a very tough problem, but I'm not for outlawing a, a private free banking contract. Um, but just as in the days before central banks, it's possible for fractional reserve banks to bring on a business cycle. So it's, it's, it's not good. Tem uma pergunta lá atrás? Liu, uma pergunta um pouco mais polêmica. É, democracia. Uh -oh. <risos> vale a pena insistir nesse erro ou devemos advogar a secessão imediata? Well, I think you can. I think uh, first of all, I'd recommend everybody, everybody read Hans Hermann Hoppe's Democracy: The God That Failed. Very, very interesting book. And uh, Hans holds that democracy has been the the friendliest form of government to the state. Uh, in the history of mankind, and it's not a coincidence that the biggest, most powerful, richest, most dangerous states, at least on a more than local level, uh, are uh, the democratic states, the liberal, somewhat liberal democratic states, um, that they're the ones that are really able to be the troublemakers. And he's got a great analysis of why, um, why democracies are so much worse than monarchies. He's, a, he's, not a, he's an adequate capitalist, of course, Hoppe, but he thinks that monarchy is the, is the least bad form of government. Um, so I hope the monarchist movement in Brazil gets going. Anyway, he, he uh, um, because the king who wants to pass on the, the realm to his, to his heirs 
always seeks to preserve the realm because he sees it in some sense as his private property. But in, under a democracy, the realm is public property. And the people who are temporary caretakers of public property rip it off. Um, and and uh, he also traces the, the most uh, fastest growth of the state in the, in the U.S. with each time the franchise was expanded. And he thinks that like a you know, one person, one vote system is actually the worst, worst possible thing. So on the other hand, there are, I mean, the trouble is, of course, the state uses these words, perverts these words, and you know, democratic can also mean sort of local self-government, or it can mean uh, friendly ways of doing things, and non-totalitarian, and, and uh, democracy as, as opposed to dictatorship and so forth. But he would argue, and I, you know, I would certainly agree with him, that that's a, that's a, that's a false dichotomy. Um, but no matter what form of government, I think secession is always an important thing to talk about. Uh, Mises said in Nation, State, and Economy that no people and, and no part of a people, as a, as a principle of classical liberalism, that no people and no part of a people should be held in a political uh, association that it does not want. And um, he even says that uh, if such a thing were technologically possible, that's not the phrase he uses, um, that even individuals should be able to secede. Well, maybe it's technologically possible now. But to even, you can, you can tell the things that outrage the regime and that you should be talking about some things like the secession. I mean, it threatens them. They're very, uh, very afraid of it because, of course, they want to consolidate. It's always a tendency towards consolidation within nation states and among nation states. And, you know, we're, we're, there's more and more of a drive for a world government, a world currency world central bank, the sort of uh, nightmare that Keynes wished upon us. Um, so I think it's, I think the actual, f you know, um, the actual facts of secession are very important. People ought to be able to secede from the EU uh, rather than being uh, kept in there against their will. People should be able to secede from, from uh, um, the U.S. central state, from the Brazilian central state, from, from any central state. And all the former the sort of Jefferson, Jeffersonian principle, uh, Lord Acton called it the one great Ameri U.S. contribution to political theory of a federalism and decentralism that by divided sovereignty, uh, by uh, having powerful uh, states as versus a central government, that overall the whole country would be, would be freer because it would each would prevent the other from getting out of hand, at least to some extent. Uh, of course, it didn't work in the U.S., right? I mean, eventually they just killed everybody who who had a different view. Um, but to talk about it, and you know, uh, uh, Walter Williams just had a wonderful column on, on secession. I always like to talk about peaceful secession. Professor Williams said peaceful secession or otherwise. <laughs> so it's very hot, of course. I'm not actually for anything but peaceful secession. But uh, I think it's very important to talk about it, to learn about it, and to, uh, and I think whether, um, in fact, we talked about, you know, what's the, could you have freedom in a nation state as large and consolidated as Brazil or the United States or what is the EU is becoming, probably not. I mean, Aristotle thought that anything more than 50,000 was, was getting out of hand. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we have to be that small, but certainly you can't, can't be hundreds of millions uh, ruled by one bunch in, in, a, in a distant government-created capital city and let's have that be... Uh, um, uh, comport with liberty. I think that's so. The whole idea of secession, talk about secession. It's also not, even the idea of breaking, you know, let's say some part of Sao Paulo wanted to break away and be its own city. That's, that, that's again of an important, an important thing and uh, to be supported. And um, typically the other people will say, hey, you can't take that. You've got to, you know, we've got to have your taxes. Well, um, in fact, the state of Sao Paulo, as I, as I learned, uh, fought for its freedom against the central government in the, in the 1930s. It was tragically defeated, but uh, fought for the, the old constitution and against, against being part of, uh, of the nation state of Brazil. So there is a, there's a, this tradition is, it goes across the world, as much as they try to suppress it, as much as they try to smear it, uh, the regime and its, and, and, uh, uh, its media. Uh, very important to think about it, write about it, talk about it. Uh, Hoppe has written a lot about it. Um, Take a look at some of his uh, FSM articles and speeches. Just go to Mises.org and put uh, secession into the search engine. You'll come up with a whole bunch of stuff. Very, very interesting. 
So I think it's, it's great to secede, and, and uh, if at first you don't secede, try, try again. Lu, você concorda com a posição do Rothbard sobre bombas atômicas, de que elas seriam ilegítimas porque não servem a propósitos defensivos individuais? E como os Estados Unidos deveriam agir no caso do programa nuclear iraniano? Bom, well, a um, minha my own, my own posição sobre the atomic bomb é que that... Uh, and I believe this was Rothbard's position, it's, it's not that it's just an offensive weapon. Obviously, any weapon can be offensive or defensive, right? I mean, a, a rifle can be a weapon of offense or, or defense. But the atomic bomb is a specific anti-civilian device, at least when he was talking about it. Now, they've got smaller ones, which they have very unfortunate development, too, but uh, the atomic bomb was designed to blow up cities. Well, that's by itself inherently immoral and a war crime. Uh, the earlier Geneva Conventions, one of the war crimes was bombing a city from the air with anything, let alone an atomic bomb. So um, I think whether we look at things from the standpoint of religion or uh, um, Rothbardian natural rights, I mean, the, the uh, you know, atomic weapons are, are, are a real problem. I don't believe that uh, Iran has a nuclear program in the sense that U.S. propaganda is holding it up as. If you remember the exact same stuff we heard about Iraq. Oh, Saddam Hussein's going to get an atomic bomb. He's going to, you know, do this and that. It was all, of course, just, these are just lies for war. Um, I suppose maybe a country has told the truth about a war it wanted to fight at some point. I'm trying to think of an example. I can't think of one, but I'm, I don't rule out such a thing as, but I don't think that, uh, I think the U.S. and uh, Israel are aggressors against Iran, certainly continuing to threaten att attacks against them. Uh, which by itself is a war crime, and uh, very, very unfortunate if, my guess is Iran does not have an atomic weapon, if they had wanted an atomic weapon, one or whatever, why would they want that, to send it to Israel or New York, or whatever, they couldn't send it to New York, but um, in order to be turned into uh, uh, molten glass, the entire country? No, they wanted to prevent um, the U.S. from being able to attack them. That it's, it would be a defensive. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing that they would have it. I'm not for anybody having atomic weapons. Not the U.S., not Israel, not Britain, China, Russia, anybody. Um, but if somebody like Iran wanted one, and lots of other countries, we know in Brazil too there's been talk of this, and the U.S. threatening, uh, threatening Brazil not to develop an atomic weapon. Uh, why, what's that, why, why, why does Brazil want an atomic weapon or a bomb Paraguay? Well, maybe over the smuggled cigarettes, right? No, I'm, I'm sure not. <laughs> it would only be because it would be, as, in effect, as a defensive weapon. Again, I don't think it's a good thing, but when you have a world empire like the U.S. that seeks to be the world government, that seeks to rule every place, has its troops every place, wants its troops more and more places, and uh, wants to be able to uh, be the global, the global authority, um, and can threaten as... Uh, Obama just said that uh, he's going to have a new nuclear doctrine where he's not going to, um, he's going to agree the U.S. won't have a first use of nuclear weapons against any um, non-nuclear power unless he decides that they, sh they shouldn't be in that category. So if they're, not, if they're not cooperating with the U.S., then he says that uh, the U.S. Can, can, can nuke them. Very, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a war crime. You can't actually... Uh, you know, whether we look at St. Augustine or every other, every other uh, theologian or uh, moral thinker has ever looked at this, you can't just bomb uh, women and children and, and uh, cities and destroy people's, destroy people's entire civilization over some government demand. It's just, it's just uh, both crazy and evil. So I think um, if the U.S. weren't threatening to do things to Iran, if the U.S. in fact weren't committing war crimes against Iran at the very moment by uh, denying free trade with Iran, you know, there are vicious sanctions on Iran. They want to step it up. They want to, for example, deny all gasoline imports. That's the next thing. Uh, and the justification is they want to put, do so much damage to the civilian population that they'll overthrow the government. Well, you're not actually allowed morally to do Uh, something evil so that something good allegedly may come of it. You can't, that's not, this is sort of not allowed. So I think that uh, 
The U.S. should have nothing to do with Iran, should mind its own business. If I had my way, Obama would bring all the troops home. And uh, Ron Paul always says, if you actually want to cut the budget, which of course has to be drastically done, you don't raise taxes, you uh, bring the troops home. Uh, bring all the clothes and all the bases. Uh, saves more than a trillion dollars a year right away. Uh, so that would be, that would be a, very, a very good step. Um, in, in, uh, I was just going to mention something that Tom Woods uh, said in his speech when he was talking about what an actual, you know, what a physical stimulus might be. Ron Paul had a great, a great point. He said, if um, he said he's not for the government having any kind of fiscal stimulus, but if they wanted to have one, he said, rather than bail out all the banks for less money than that, they could have um, given every single American a one-year reprieve from all federal taxes. He said at least that would allow, he said it's still not a good use of, of uh, uh, printing press money, but nevertheless, you know, maybe that would have been an actual stimulus. Certainly morally it would have been a good thing to allow people to keep their own incomes for a year, and then maybe they would be unhappy at giving them back away again uh, and when the year was up. Um, so anyway, I don't think, I don't believe that Iran is uh, Hitler. I don't believe that Ahmadinejad is Hitler. Of course, he's a crazy Keynesian, so there's much wrong with him. He's done terrible things into the economy of Iran and terrible inflationist and many, many things wrong with him. He's not Hitler. And uh, this whole uh, propaganda campaign that's being ginned up um, is for conquest. Uh, the U.S. wants to control all the oil in the Middle East, not so much that it can get it cheap for American citizens. They couldn't care less about us. But so it can deny it to other countries if it needs to for power reasons. So they can deny China, Russia, um, Brazil for that matter, any other country, if they're not obeying, then um, they can be denied. Vamos para a última pergunta. O que é mais importante para o avanço da liberdade? A difusão da ciência econômica ou a difusão da ideia de direitos naturais? Well, I think there. I think, I guess, I, I guess I would say that spreading economic science is the most important. Um, I don't know whether there actually are natural rights, in my own view, in the sense that it's normally said. I, I tend to think with Rothbard that everything is property rights. It extends from your property and yourself and your justly acquired um, property outside your body, um, and that you have a right to free speech on your property, and you have a right to free speech on somebody else's property if you've uh, contracted with them or they allow you to have it. But you don't have like a free-floating right to free speech that you can exercise uh, on, at the mall or uh, in the lobby of this hotel you know, or in your next door neighbor's front yard. You don't, uh, you don't ha have such a thing. Um, but I think it's important, but uh, sort of the basis in, in one sense of, of uh, sound economics is property rights. So I think that, uh, I think the two, you know, I, th I would say the two, two go together. But um, I think economics is more important than, say, um, the th you know, a theory of natural rights. But I don't think they're at all contradictory. I don't think you have, I think it's possible to be working in all sorts of areas. And some people, right, this is a great diverse movement. Some people work in one, others in, in, in other areas. And uh, different people will be a appealed to by different approaches. So we need everybody doing, we need people doing every sort of thing. Uh, whether it's in Brazil or every other country, to advance the idea that, uh, if I can put it baldly, that the state is our enemy on earth, uh, that it's the enemy of mankind, um, the secular enemy of mankind anyway, uh, that it uh, is a parasite, that it starts wars, it kills people, it steals, kidnaps, uh, of course it calls it the draft or it calls it uh, taxes, it calls it war, doesn't call it murder, uh, looting, and, uh, and kidnapping, and all the rest of the things it does. Um, so I think it's, but on the other hand, if we're talking about from a libertarian standpoint, probably the most important thing, I, I was like Stefan Kinsella's formulation, that all it takes to be, a, to be an anarchist is to think that you don't have the right, and no one has the right, to um, initiate aggression against an innocent person to initiate force against the innocent, that it's not or to threaten the initiation of force. If you agree that that's wrong, then you're an anarchist. 
By the way, that doesn't mean that you think an anarchist society could ever come about. It doesn't mean you know how things would work or any of those kinds of questions. But you just think that the fundamental, the fundamental instrument of government, which is the gun at your head or the knife at your belly or whatever, uh, tell, ordering you to do things. And uh, even though you've done nothing wrong, we're not talking about criminals. Uh, maybe we're talking about public criminals. But anyway, I just say uh, there's room, you know, there's room for uh, uh, many, many different approaches. Uh, let a hundred flowers bloom. Let a, was it what was Mao Tse Tung said? Let a thousand flowers bloom. Let a hundred schools of thought contend. So I, I actually mean it, unlike Mao. But I think uh, certainly within libertarianism, there's room for not only all the old approaches, new approaches, new ideas. Uh, I think it's great to have. You know, David Friedman saying what he says, and there's just let, uh, let everybody make their best argument for human freedom. It's the most important thing we can do. Tem mais uma pergunta aqui na plateia. Oi, boa tarde, Leo. É, a primeira pergunta é sobre a reforma do, do sistema financeiro americano do senador Dodd. Queria saber se qual das duas propostas que é mais propícia ao fim do FED. Se é a proposta republicana de concentrar poder no FED, ou se é a democrata de criar várias agências e mais burocracia e descentralização de poder mesmo. Um, is there a difference? I mean, the re Republicans guy was Greenspan, also Bernanke's the Republican guy. Maybe the Democrats, if you look, look back to Paul Volcker, who was the last time that there was an actual cut in the money supply and uh, actually stopped inflation for a time. Um, in one case, the Democrats did better, but I don't, I don't really think there's any difference. There's a difference in the interest groups that they service sometimes. There's a difference in the rhetoric they use, but I, I agree with Butler Schaefer that the, uh, the two part, they're just two wings of the same bird of prey, the Republicans and the Democrats. I, don't, uh, I mean, the Republicans have better rhetoric in some ways, but if we look at the Bush administration's eight years, pretty bad, although uh, it's Roger Garrison who says that uh, sooner or later every American president makes you nostalgic for his predecessor. So I'm already missing Bush. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> so, and probably someday I'll miss Obama. 